report on this computer. Okay, so what we're going to cover in this particular Zoom session is we're going to summarize cochlear physiology, the last unit we covered a couple of weeks ago before the break, and then we will start in on the eighth nerve and the central auditory nervous system. So here's hoping you had both sets of uh, PowerPoints or whatever uh, notes printed up, but let's share screen here. And I'll make that smaller, and there's Iceland again. And we will look at inner ear physiology. Let's just summarize this. There's three, several main points to really understand or make sure we understand about cochlear physiology. So here we go. If you read this paragraph, it talks about the way the traveling wave moves in the cochlea. And it's rather interesting. All sounds entering the cochlea travel in a ripple wave along the basilar membrane, which travels from the base to the apex. The waves go hundreds of times slower than sound does in air, taking a few milliseconds to complete a journey of a few millimeters over the sensory air cells. Each individual frequency component wave grows in intensity as it travels, eventually reaching a peak before coming to a complete stop at some unique place along the basilar membrane. Now, we are in the interest of sharing screen. What I'm going to do is pull up, um, what do you call it, a YouTube, and I'm just going to enter here on Google, cochlear traveling wave. Cochlear, I can't even spell cochlear. Come on, Ted. Cochlear traveling wave. There you go. And I'll just hit return there. And then I'm going to see if I can grab a video of this. We'll see if we get it. There we go. Take this one, just for the fun of it. Don't know if you've seen this one or not, but I think it's really quite good. We'll make it larger. You're not hearing much now. See if we get anything here. It's unrolling. There's the basilar membrane. See if we get sound. Interesting how the low frequencies stimulate that wide end of the cochlea. Let's see if I can't, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just scrunch that down now and go back to the notes. But it's very, it's, it's very tonotopic. And the wide end of the basilar membrane is the low frequencies. The narrow end of the basilar membrane, high frequencies. Basilar membrane, the floor upon which the hair cells all stand. Okay, and that floor is what is rippling. Von Beckesy put a star by his name. Make sure we know who he was. He was the guy who discovered the traveling wave. Gold put a star by his name because he's the guy that suggested to von Beckesy that the outer hair cells did something different. He suggested that the outer hair cells amplified and sharpened the traveling wave. Von Beckesy disagreed and said no. Okay, there are three names here, actually four. The first one's von Helmholtz. He's discovered that the, that the cochlea was tonotopic. Specifically, frequencies are represented in specific places. Helmholtz, see what this guy looked like, okay? There you go. Friedrich, oh no, Hermann von Helmholtz, yeah. Okay, so he discovered the cochlea was tonotopic. This guy discovered how the traveling wave worked. 
He won a Nobel Prize for his efforts in 1961. You can see the cochlea and the balance organs drawn on a Swedish stamp, Sveriga. Von Bekesey again, passed away in 1973. Here's gold, a picture of the man who disagreed with Von Bekesey and who suggested that the cochlea actually was sharpened, the traveling wave was sharpened, and therefore frequency resolution was increased by means of the outer hair cells. There's a picture of gold as an older man, soon before he passed away. Okay, this is the fourth name, Kemp. Kemp is the guy who discovered auto-acoustic emissions. Auto, ear, acoustic sound, emissions out. That the, cochlea, that the cochlea actually produces sound, believe it or not, which leaves, produces traveling waves, which bump the foot plate of the stapes, which move the middle ear ossicles, which in turn move the eardrum like a speaker, and the ears producing sounds, very, very soft sounds. Sounds like minus 10 dB SPL, very, very soft. But these sounds are produced by the cochlear outer hair cells. As we've seen, the outer hair cells are constantly working, constantly stretching and shrinking, constantly sharpening the traveling wave, and you don't get something for nothing. All work has a byproduct. And the byproduct of physical work is sweat. The byproduct of putting your hand on a light bulb is heat. Okay? The byproduct of the outer hair cells working their tails off is autoacoustic emissions. And audiologists actually measure autoacoustic emissions in infants to find out if their hair cell integrity is intact. So these are things to, to, to consider. Looking again now at the horizontal and the vertical movement of the cochlea. This is another section we need to look at. I believe you will find this at the bottom half of page one in your notes. Okay, how does the base, how does the traveling wave work? Put a star by this. The horizontal and vertical motions in the cochlea. And what do I mean by the horizontal and vertical movements in the cochlea is simply this. You can see this picture here. The foot plate of the state piece pushes in and out of the oval window. Look at the red and green arrows. That's what I mean by the horizontal back and forth movement. The vertical movement, look on the right. This is the vertical movement, and that bulge down on the Reissner's membrane and the bulge down on the basilar membrane, the floor upon which the hair cells stand, that is the vertical motion going up and down. So you've got a back and forth motion translating into a vertical motion. How the Sam Hill does that happen? Okay, that's a sideways picture. Well, you can look at it sideways, turn your head sideways, but you can see the vertical, the horizontal motion making this. And how does that happen? Look at it this way. Here's a picture from Von Bekesey of an unrolled cochlea. One inch long. Foot plate of the stapes. Here's foot plate of the stapes. Pushing in and out of the oval window. Well, look what this fluid here gets squeezed around the helicotrema. And it's because of this narrow little point. A pressure buildup is caused. When this fluid is pushed, it has to be bending around this area. And the fluid can't be compressed, so something has to give. And because of the pressure buildup, because of that narrow helicotrema, we've got an up and down movement. Take that square right where my cursor is and look at it like this, like my hand, and turn it this way. And what you're doing is looking up at the top right. One coil of the cochlea, and now you're looking at that vertical movement. And that vertical movement is seen here. Okay? Very important point to consider. And again, a nursing textbook, an unrolled cochlea. This is a boring picture. Who cares? This is a picture showing you that the cochlea is tonotopic. High frequencies at the base, mids in the middle, lows at the apex, very important to consider. Another picture showing you how the cochlea is tonotopic, high frequencies at the base, mids in the middle, 
lows at the apex. Another picture showing you the vertical and horizontal movements. Horizontal arrows going around the helicotrema and out to bounce on the round window. The vertical motion is seen on the right, up and down. That's the traveling wave. That traveling wave may occur at the base here. It may occur here. It may occur here. And as we saw in the YouTube, it can occur any particular place along the basilar membrane. And those traveling waves, if we look at a cross section of the cochlea, you'd see this. Okay? So this is saying that a peak of a traveling wave occurred here. Not here where my cursor is. Not here, but here. All right? And again, not here, not here, but supposedly maybe here. Who knows? Showing you yet another picture of the horizontal and vertical motions. Pushing in, maybe the indentation takes place here, maybe the indentation takes place there, who knows? But these little weird white lines, I guess, are what they're trying to draw as hair cells, okay? Inside the scala media. Paralymph, paralymph, endolymph. And yes, I guess this green is the basilar membrane, I guess this blue here is the tectorial membrane, and these are the hair cells that would be standing in between those. Once again, eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes, foot plate of the oval window, horizontal movement making a vertical movement take place. And wherever that vertical movement takes place, whether it's here or whether it's here, what's taking place is a shearing or bending of the hairs of the cochlea, of the hair cells. And think of it this way, and I said this two weeks ago too, don't think of it as my hands doing this, okay? Because otherwise nothing is happening between my hands. The only way to make this make sense is to have two hinges. So if I had elastic bands between my fingers, okay, you've got two hinges taking place. And that is essentially what's being shown here. Here's one hinge, here's another hinge. And when the whole thing is bent, the hairs get bent. And when the hairs get bent, they send a message up the eighth nerve to the brain. We'll summarize here. The middle ear changes sound waves into mechanical energy. The cochlea takes that mechanical energy and transduces or changes that into hydraulic traveling wave energy. And the hair cells take that hydraulic traveling wave energy and change that into electricity. And that's the language the brain understands. Looking here, same thing. Note the two hinges, one here, one here. So at the, when the traveling wave reaches its peak, at some unique place along the basilar membrane, this action takes place. Here you're showing a traveling wave near the base. Here you're showing a traveling wave near the apex. But by gum and by gum almighty, look at how they are asymmetrical. Notice how the envelope, the outline of the wave, is shaped like a kite. A steep front, longer tail. And the steep front faces the apex of the cochlea. The long tail slopes back toward Kalamazoo, Michigan. Okay? It slopes back toward the base. Looking at it here, they're showing you yet another way of, of looking at it. The base of the cochlea has the widest or the narrowest basilar membrane. The apex has the widest more mass, that's why it resonates with low frequencies. Less mass, more stiff, that's why this area resonates with highs. High frequency traveling waves here, mids here, lows here. Showing you yet again in a different slide. Look at the way they draw the uh, semicircular canals. Nice going, even I could do that. Anyway, low frequency traveling wave, mid frequency traveling wave, high frequency traveling wave but they are always asymmetrical. Here they're showing it a third time, low frequency wave, mid and highs. They're always asymmetrical, and this translates toward what we call the upward spread of masking. So let's see if we can go there. Here we go.
here's a truck outside your house, the red. Blah, 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 blah. Here's the canary in your kitchen in a cage. Beep, 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 beep. A soft, high-frequency traveling wave confined to the base of the cochlea. A louder, low-frequency traveling wave from the truck rumbling outside. Notice how the envelope of this wave can easily cover the envelope of the high-frequency canary. But it doesn't work the other way around. That hairy canary can, can, can peep all she wants, but that traveling wave as she gets louder is going to get taller, but it's not going to go very far out this way. And that's why lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. And this too has big reasons, big implications for your clients. What's the main complaint of hearing aid wearers? Background noise. And what's most background noise? Low frequency. And what's the most important sounds for us to hear in speech? High frequency consonants. So low frequency background noise easily masks or covers high frequency consonants of speech. And why? Because of the shape of the traveling wave. It's asifrican metrical. And that is cochlear physiology that most HISs in the United States do not understand. Audiologists are trained in this. HISs usually are not. Most HISs graduating with an IHS one-year distance ed program are not taught this. They are taught that lows, you know, that background noise wreaks havoc with hearing speech, but they aren't taught why. And here we are learning in, a co in the cochlea and physiologically how come. And that's very important. It separates things. Here is another facet. So the one big, okay, we talked about the horizontal, vertical, have a handle on that. Another set of handles to grab is the asymmetrical wave and upward spread of masking. Grab that one, put it in your backpack. Here's the third one. How many fingers? There, three, Ted. Here's the third one. The sharpening and amplification done by the outer hair cells. So here's a hot, low frequency traveling wave. Here's a high frequency traveling wave. A low frequency tone was heard, a high frequency tone was heard, and it's the outer hair cells that amplify these little dots and sharpen the two-fold roll of the outer hair cells. I will now pull out of here and go to the notes, and we'll look at the two-fold roll of the outer hair cells. So we've got this in our notes. We talk about traveling waves versus sound waves. Well, you know traveling waves are transverse. Sound waves are longitudinal. I would put a star by this guy, too. Okay? I'm not going to go over it, but you can read this. Anybody can read this. This is knowledge and stuff we've gone over a thousand times. Sound waves are squeezing and separating of molecules, condensation and rarefaction. Water waves are up and down. The traveling wave is, is a transverse like a water wave. The motion goes this way, but the up and down of the wave is perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Okay. Please remember sound waves do not enter the cochlea. Sound creates traveling waves inside the cochlea. But sound waves can't enter the cochlea. A 250 hertz tone, it says here, look what it says, is, is four and a half feet long. That's not going to fit into a one inch long cochlea. Okay? So sound never, ever, ever enters a cochlea. Sound waves create mechanical energy in the middle ear, which in turn creates transverse traveling waves in the cochlea. And traveling waves are not sound waves. Okay. Then we talked about the asymmetrical wave, the shape like a kite. Put a star by that and say kite. Okay, lows mask highs versus highs versus better than highs mask lows. The bottom part of page two is just talking about the shearing action of the stereocilia. Look closely at this page. I couldn't care less about the bottom five or six lines. Who cares? Leave them alone. Doesn't matter. 
You can read them if you want to, but I don't care. It's not going to be on any test. Here you go. Put a star by this puppy here, traveling wave, and the two-fold role of the outer air cells. They amplify sounds below 50, and they sharpen the traveling wave peak. Okay? You can read all about it here, but basically this is all stuff that we have discovered and talked about a lot. And mainly just to show you in the pictures that we've discussed and described already. Not that, that's boring. I'll leave that alone here. Let's go up here, let's go up here. Let's see if we'll find traveling wave fizzy. There you go. There's your passive traveling wave that Von Beckesy discovered. You want a Nobel Prize for that. Low stimulate the apex, high stimulate the base. Gold said, maybe this is going on. And von Beckesy disagreed. It took some 50 years later. And Kemp, who discovered autoacoustic emissions, phoned up Gold and said, you know what? You are right. You are entirely correct. I found autoacoustic emissions, which are a result of the outer hair cells doing that. It's quite amazing when you think about all the, uh, let's see if I've got a picture here, I'm going up, up here. Look at all these traveling waves from the word information. Here's one word going down here, information. And look at all these traveling waves crossing the basilar membrane. So this is the, the base of the cochlea on the right and the apex of the cochlea on the left. And the only reason we're looking down is we're talking about time. So look at all these traveling waves with the one word information. In, from my voice, loud, low, traveling waves near the apex of the cochlea. High frequency, little, tiny traveling waves. Formation. Look at the little high frequency traveling waves confined to the, ape, to the base. Shun, as soon as you're using the voice again, louder and lower, okay? And on each of these traveling waves are sharpening taking place. So that just gives an indication as to the utterly bizarre complexity of the human cochlea. And I think that's really where we need to, uh, what we need to appreciate here in terms of cochlear physiology. Now, I could go here and talk about these two slides, but I'm not going to. I'm going to save that for disorders next semester. So I'm not going to, or in the summer, I'm not going to even go there right now. I'm going to leave it alone. It's just a little bit over the top. But just for the fun of it, I'll just tell you a piece of it anyway. What the heck, I can't resist. Let's say I went to Nicole's house, and in the middle of the night, I took out all of her hair cells of her cochlea below 1,000 hertz. Everything. So you were deaf below 1,000 hertz. I killed your outer hair cells and killed Nicole's inner hair cells below 1,000 hertz and left them all intact above 1,000 hertz. The next day, I did a hearing test on Nicole. You'd think that because I pulled out all the outer hair cells and inner hair cells below 1,000 hertz that she would be, that her hearing levels, these O's here, would be right at the bottom. But guess what? They would be looking like this. Because look at the traveling waves. Once I make the sound loud enough, present, pretend this is your basilar membrane with hair cells on it. If I make the traveling wave near the apex of the cochlea playing a low frequency tone, look at the shallow slope. It excites healthy mid-frequency hair cells. She's going to raise her hand. You are going to be hearing these frequencies with these hair cells. Do -de -de -do -do -de -de -do. Okay, have a look at this one. A high frequency precipitous hearing loss. Good hearing in the lows, poor hearing in the highs. If I present at 2000 hertz loud enough, I'm making a big traveling wave and the front of it will just stimulate these healthy hair cells. So if I went to Nicole's house at night and I stole every hair cell in her ear above 1000 hertz, so that she was deaf above a thousand hertz. You'd think all of her hearing thresholds would lie on the bottom here. Uh-uh, it would look like this. Because as I went further and further into the dead area, if I made the sounds louder, the front of the wave this time would stimulate 
healthy hair cells. The backward traveling, or this, this, always remember the steep front of the wave always faces the apex. Steep front of the wave always faces the apex, but it's the shape of the wave. Okay. Anyway, but don't worry about that. Okay. La -dee 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 -da -dee -dee. You've all seen it, seen it, done it, got the t-shirt, been there. Auto acoustic emissions. We finish with this. The ear in reverse. A probe is put in the ear. Don't worry about this picture. It's talking about outer hair cells and inner hair cells. A probe is put into the ear canal. Tones are produced by the probe. And looky here, the outer hair cells create a traveling wave. So you're making a traveling wave here and a traveling wave here from two separate tones, and a third little one comes out. And it's that third little one that goes this way and bounces against the stapes and wiggles the eardrum like a speaker, produces auto-acoustic emissions. You only have OAEs if you have healthy outer hair cells. If you kill off the outer hair cells, absent OAEs. That's how they test infants. Here's another picture showing it to you. Here's the probe put in your ear, has one speaker and a second speaker and a mic. Frequency one comes here, frequency two comes there. They put two separate frequencies in the ear. They go through the ear canal, they go through the middle ear, they go to the cochlea, and the outer hair cells produce that third wave that comes back out of the ear and gets picked up by the mic. Auto acoustic emissions. Showing you here the tone one and tone two, and here's the auto acoustic emission. NF is just the noise floor in your ear canal. The two tones, a spectrum of the two tones in your ear canal, and the auto acoustic emission on the left. Okay, basically, here's an audiogram. X's are the left ear, O's are the right ear. This is me some years ago. The green is the noise floor in my right ear. The and the green is the noise floor in my left ear. The red shows autoacoustic emissions, autoacoustic emissions, and suddenly dropping here. Well, that's where my hearing got worse. Look at that. So I have dying outer hair cells here. Same with the left ear. Healthy OAEs for the lows, healthy OAEs for the mids. Boom, down in the highs, because I'm losing high frequency hearing. Doesn't mean I'm not a nice person, it's just losing high frequency hearing. And we talked about this in 110, just about an hour and a half ago. Loudness growth for reduced versus dynamic, reduced for normal versus reduced dynamic range. This is a very important picture, and people should really make it their business to put a star by this one as well, because this explains compression in hearing aids. Normal loudness growth, normal hearing, 10 to 20 sounds soft. Look at the red line. For normal hearing, 50 to 60 sounds comfortable. For normal hearing, 100 sounds too loud. Kill off your outer hair cells. Now you're looking at the light blue line. Now 50 to 60 sounds soft, and yet 100 sounds too loud. So hearing aids today use something called wide dynamic range compression, WD. R C and WDRC is an electronic way whereby to imitate outer hair cells. Amplify soft sounds by a lot and amplify middle sounds by less and amplify loud sounds by little or nothing at all. Compression. Here's the floor being raised that we saw in 110 earlier today. Here's the hearing loss on the left. Good hearing in the lows, poorer hearing in the highs. This is on the audiogram. These numbers here along the vertical are in dBSPL. These numbers on the left are dBHL on the audiogram, okay? But here in SPL, we can see literally the floor being raised while the ceiling of loudness tolerance doesn't change. And again, to show with my hands, Basically, the ceiling of loudness tolerance doesn't change. It's the floor that gets elevated with sensory neural hearing loss. 
Now we are almost at the end of this unit, and I believe we just about are. Ah, don't worry about that. Eh, it's excess. You can read it if you want. But so basically, looking at types of hearing loss. This is presbycusis. This is the most common hearing loss you're going to see. The X's on the uh, are the left ear. The O's are the right ear. So head. Listening under headphones, you can see the person's got good hearing in the low frequencies, and the hearing gradually gets worse and worse to about a 50 decibel hearing loss in the high frequencies. Outer air cell damage. Where? Near the base of the cochlea, where the foot plate of the stapes and the enters the oval window. Okay? Think of that as the entryway into the room, the carpet in front of the door. All sounds... All traveling waves have to begin there, so that's the area that gets worn out fast. The treble tends to go first. The bass is decent, so this person now, when they take off the headphones and they put a bone oscillator, a little headband around the person's head, feel the bone behind your ear. That's called your mastoid bone. They put a little box on your mastoid bone attached to a headband, and they deliver, they deliver tones through that way. And when they deliver tones through that way, look at that. The hearing didn't get any better. See these hatch marks? That hatch mark here and here? The hearing didn't get any better. That means the hearing loss is due to hair cell damage because when I avoided the outer ear and I avoided the middle ear and put the sound straight to the cochlea through the bone, the hearing didn't get any better. Contrast that to a kid with an earache. A child with an earache has an infected middle ear. The X's and O's will go flat across the board, around 50 decibels, because they have otitis, media, oto, ear, itis, inflammation, media, middle. Pus behind the drum. The child's going to have a flat hearing loss across around 40 to 50 dB. Take the headband and put the sound through the bone, and the child's going to hear like a baby. Follow my cursor right along the top. Perfectly normal hearing through the bone, hearing loss through the headphones. Conductive hearing loss. It can get fixed. This one here, sensory neural, uh-uh. Presbycusis, hearing loss in the elder. Presbyterian, church of the elders. Presbyopia, your arms aren't long enough to see the page. Hits you when you're 40. Presbycusis, trouble hearing treble. Hits you when you're 65. What's another type of pathology of the inner ear? Noise-induced hearing loss. NIHL, perfectly normal hearing for the lows and mid frequencies, and it's like a rat came into your house and just bit out a chunk of your hearing at 4,000 hertz. Look at this, a chunk, torn out at 4,000 hertz. And then the hearing gets better at 8,000 hertz. Now you know why that's the case. Here's why. Look at the resonance of your outer ear. Remember we covered that in week one? Your outer ear, the shape of it, like a wine glass at Christmas, resonates. Well, this causes this. Okay? So noise, when it enters the ear, okay, you're getting a lift because of the outer ear right between these frequencies. And noise tends to damage hair cells about a half an octave higher than the noise. So if these frequencies are given about a 20 decibel lift by the resonance of your outer ear, and if you move this a little bit to the right, a half an octave, and flip it upside down, what do you got? Noise-induced hearing loss. So always memorize this. Noise-induced hearing loss has a notch at 4,000 hertz. It gets, the hearing is normal up to 2,000 hertz, and then at 4,000 hertz, you've got a notch taken out of it, and then at 8,000 hertz, it gets better again. This is a hunter with noise-induced hearing loss. Look at that. Hair cell regions, inner hair cells, outer hair cells, all healthy, 
and then boom, in this high frequency area, dead. Here's a right-handed hunter. Inner hair cells, mostly living a bit killed off here. Outer hair cells, killed off here, but not as much. When you're right-handed, and like a good American, I'll hold a rifle here, okay? If you're right-handed, what ear is facing what ear is facing the most noise? My left. So my left ear is going to have more damage. If I'm left-handed, my right ear is going to have more damage. So just think about that when you're thinking about hearing loss due to target practice. This is a right-handed hunter. His left ear had most hair cell damage. Anyway, just thought I'd tell you. Weird stuff. This is Meniere's disease. You'll cover this later on in your disorders too. Please don't think you have to know all of this is right now, but Meniere's disease is too much endolymph in the scala media. Too much, like my cheeks. Okay, and that's gonna cause a reverse rising hearing loss. Good hearing in the lows, Poorer hearing, in, or I should say poorer hearing in the lows, better hearing in the highs. And I guess this person only has Meniere's disease in his right ear. The left ear is normal. So you'll be covering lots of that in your disorders course. We'll be crossing this bridge again. Here's Meniere's, again, rising. And how come? Look at the basilar membrane along the top. It's widest and has most mass over the low frequencies. It's narrowest and most stiff over the high frequencies. This area is less mass. When you get too much fluid, it's less stiff area as well. So it's going to be the area that bulges with too much fluid pressure. This area isn't going to bulge much because the walls here are much more stiff. The basilar membrane is much more stiff toward the highs. And remember, highs resonate with stiffness. This area has more mass, but the walls, the basilar membrane is much more flaccid. So with too much endolymph, the low frequency area here is going to get the most bulging, hence the most hearing loss in the low frequencies. But we'll cross this way again next time. Stop ringing, tinnitus. Just so we know, ringing in the ears, drugs don't help. No matter what Walmart or what K Kmart or what drug stores are selling whatever snake oil to stop ringing in the ears, uh-uh, we can't stop it that way. The best thing to stop ringing in the ears is to wear hearing aids because the noise picked up by hearing aids, the background noise, the silver lining to that cloud is it masks or covers the tinnitus. You'll learn more about that in your counseling course. So tinnitus relief, don't believe it. It's snake oil, okay? This is a cochlear implant. I'm just showing you pictures here. Here's a cochlear implant. It's not a hearing aid. This person's deaf. And they implant this under the, in the bone under the skin of your, of your, of behind your ear. And there's a wire that goes right behind your eardrum and goes into your round window. And they snake it around into your cochlea. A cochlear implant, in a way, is like a replacement of hair cells. The hair cells are dead. So the person can't benefit from a hearing aid because there's no hair cells to, to, to sense anything. So the person wears a cochlear implant. And now the eighth nerve fibers touch the bottom of these electrodes. So you're replacing hair cells, literally. The hair cells are gone, and so you're, you're allowing the eighth nerve to touch these electrodes. And then the person can hear again. It's rather interesting. Here's a, another picture of a cochlear implant. We can cover that more later on as well, but basically a cochlear implant is not a hearing aid. It doesn't make sounds louder to hit the eardrum. The cochlear implant is inserted surgically, and it's the electrodes, in a way, serve as a replacement to inner hair cells. So they take sound, and they chant, the, the cochlear implant picks up the sound, and it tr changes it into electricity, and the electrical current is sent up the eighth nerve from these electrodes here. That's what happens, cochlear implant. Done that unit. Okay, I'm going to close that PowerPoint. I'm going to close this particular Microsoft Word notes. I'm going to have a sip of my coffee right here. We got 20 minutes left. 
Let's take a chill pill here, and then we will enter your final unit of this course. And we're not going to get near covering it. We're just going to open the door and look in. Okay? So we'll just take a look, see, at retro coat, the eighth nerve and central auditory nervous system. <sighs> take a break here. Look at the PowerPoint here. We're going to talk about nerves, stuff, and things. Right now, I'll inhale a cup of coffee through my nose, okay? Gargle with it a little bit. All right, put on my Missouri glasses that someone gave me in Springfield 20 years ago. All right. <sighs> Lots to cover, eh? A whole bunch of stuff in there. But I really wanted to summarize cochlear physiology because it had been a couple of weeks, and it's always good to just be able to grab it and put it in your basket and carry it home, take those eggs home. All right, let's share screen, and we'll just delve into a little bit about the eighth nerve. Now, the eighth nerve is really quite cool. We'll take a look-see at the eighth nerve as it leaves the cochlea. I'm just going to blow this picture up here. So here's your semicircular canals on the left. Here's your cochlea on the right. And what they're showing in the cochlea here is only the scala media, only the membranous labyrinth, only the hair cell area, okay? It's just showing you the scala media in gray. So follow my cursor. This is where the hair cells are of the cochlea, wrapping right around two and a half coils as we've studied. That, by the way, is how many coils the cochlea has, two and a half. But now, when you look at these tiny little fibers, if you will look and see how they are leaving the cochlea, look at how, you, how many fibers you have thousands and thousands of these fibers and they're all leaving the inner hair cells and the eighth nerve is twisted like a rope made of many many fibers they call this the cochlear nerve that's the eighth nerve okay the cochlear duct all that means is scala media where the hair cells are so looking here, semicircular canals, we don't care about that. They also have, are form part of the eighth nerve. They have the, the vestibular portion joins the auditory portion, but we're most interested in the auditory portion. The eighth nerve is tonotopic. You can see the apex of the cochlea here. Eighth nerve fibers on the inside represent the low frequencies. Eighth nerve fibers on the outside represent the high frequencies. So in that way, not only is the cochlea tonotopic, but so is the eighth nerve. Now, here's another picture showing it to you. Here's your cochlea, and here's your eighth nerve fibers all leaving the cochlea. And here's the, eight, here's the fibers leaving the vestibular system the utricle, the saccule, the semicircular canals, and these neurons join the eighth nerve, and they go through what is called the internal auditory meatus. Now let me just write this down on a piece of paper here, just so we've got it down. E-A-M-I-A. And I will stop sharing and I will highlight this. EAM, ear canal, external auditory meatus. Meatus in Latin just means tunnel. External auditory tunnel. The internal auditory meatus is the small tunnel going from your cochlea to your brain. So it's the small tunnel here, right where, my co right where my cursor is, where the eighth nerve goes through to meet the brain. Now, you might be wondering what the heck this weird-looking log is here, okay? That is the seventh nerve, not the eighth, the seventh. 
Do you remember what the seventh nerve does? It works, makes your cheeks, works your cheeks. If you have seventh nerve problems, you have Bell's palsy. Your face looks like this. Okay? Now, this seventh nerve is working, but this one isn't pulling my face evenly to be in the center. Bell's palsy. Okay, we had a prime minister, which is like your president in Canada. His name was Jean, is Jean Chrétien, and he's got Bell's palsy. His face is always like this, and he's a French-Canadian guy. He talks like this, and he says, at least you cannot accuse me from talking from both sides of my mouth. <laughs> he's got a good sense of humor, all right? Anyway, the seventh facial nerve is what's attached to the stapedius muscle. Remember the acoustic reflex? The two little muscles, the tensor tympani muscle attached to the, to the malleus, the stapedius muscle attached to the stapes, and that contracts in your middle ear, making the sound of your own voice not quite so loud. Review that, but at any rate, the seventh facial nerve goes through the very same tunnel as the eighth nerve. So when people get an eighth nerve tumor, it often affects the face. Because if you get a tumor along one of these nerves here, it's going to affect the seventh facial nerve too because a tumor is a bulge growing and it's going to squeeze this nerve as well. Anyway, this is the internal auditory meatus. This facial nerve, I should say the eighth nerve, is only one inch long from the cochlea to the brain stem and it joins the brain stem. And what is the brain stem? The brain stem is your spinal cord inside your skull. Your, the bottom of your skull has a great big hole, and the spinal cord goes right up and through and into that hole, and then it goes up and it forms your brain. Okay? So your, 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 your spinal cord inside your skull is called your brain stem. This would be your cortex, the back of your head, the, the, the cerebellum, which helps you walk without stumbling. And then your brain stem narrows down to, oh gosh, about the width of a pencil. Okay? It's about the width of a pencil. And it goes down through, leaves your skull, and forms your spinal cord. It goes down all the way down to your rear end. Okay. So, the brain stem. The distance from your cochlea to your brain stem is about an inch just so we know. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and the eighth pair is the auditory and balance nerve, the vestibular portion, and it's the shortest of all your cranial nerves. Okay, I got weird pictures here to show you. I don't know if I want to go there today, but here's an eighth nerve tumor. Look at this. Have a look-see. Here's an external auditory meatus, eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes, cochlea, balance organs, and here's the internal auditory meatus, right through the bone. And so your eighth nerve, the auditory portion, and the vestibular portion join together. Now look at this guy. He's got a tumor. Look where it says here, tumor, and follow the arrow. Yep, right down there. So that's going to be squeezing on the facial, the seventh nerve, the one that works your cheeks, Okay, because that's right here. Here's your vestibular portion of your eighth nerve. Our faces are in the way you can't see it, but the cochlear portion of your eighth nerve. And this guy's got a tumor. Now, that internal auditory meatus is a tunnel through bone. And you can't really squeeze that because it's bone. So there's no give. When there's a pinch of the eighth nerve there, you got Houston, we got a problem. But what happens if the eighth nerve can leave that tunnel or the, or the tumor, what happens if the tumor grows along the eighth nerve, like grows along my finger like this, and then gets through that tunnel and then, ah, it can expand like crazy. So here you're looking at the bottom of your brain. It's like me with my head like this, okay? Here's your spinal, here's your uh, brain stem, and here's the seventh nerve. Here's the eighth nerve, and here's the tumor. Look at how bulged that guy is. An eighth nerve tumor will easily can grow big once it gets outside of the internal auditory meatus, because the internal auditory meatus is solid bone. It's just a little tunnel. 
So the, the, the tumor can't grow much in there. It wants to escape and get out of there so it can grow. And look what happens. Once you got over out through the tunnel, look at how big it can get. And look at how it bends. And that whole brain stem is bent. This guy is going to have lots of problems other than just hearing problems. The eighth nerve pathology is a red flag in our field. You know how you recognize it? I'll show you. Presbycusis, both ears. Similar treble hearing loss, both ears. Noise-induced hearing loss might be more in one ear than the other. Is the person a right-handed hunter, left-handed hunter, right-handed dentist, left-handed dentist? Is he a trucker? Does he have his left window open? Okay, then he's going to get more hearing loss in his left ear. But you're a good HIS. You took a case history. So you know why you know this person, what his job is and all that. Eighth nerve tumor is to be expected or suspected. If the person's a young person, 30 years old, with for some reason hearing loss in one ear, and it's not conductive, it's sensory neural. You did tests. Bone conduction was not normal. The whole, the person has a, has a hearing loss in one ear. Why would that happen to a young adult? Eighth nerve tumor. You get someone in your office that has hearing loss in one ear and it's sensory neural, you have to refer to a doctor. You cannot fit with hearing aids. The person has to, you have to have an eighth nerve tumor ruled out. And doctors do tests and so do audiologists to rule out an eighth nerve tumor. Now, how common are they? <laughs> Not very. Where do you live? Nicole, where do you live? What city do you live in? Springfield, Missouri. Do you live in Springfield? How many people live in Springfield? 150,000? Give or take. Give or take? That would mean about one and a half people in Springfield has a tumor, has an eighth nerve tumor. The incidence of an eighth nerve tumor is one in 100,000. Okay? okay. Eighth, yeah, so if you have a city of 100,000 people, one person might have it. You got to get surgery to get it out because it will kill you. It's not a malignant tumor. It's a benign tumor. It's not cancerous, but it will kill you because of where it is. And it'll just grow bigger and bigger, and eventually you'll be taking a dirt nap, which means you're dead. So basically, eighth nerve tumors are a dangerous thing, and all HISs are trained specifically to recognize the red flag of unilateral sensory neural loss. They call that retrocochlear pathology. Retro meaning behind. Retrocochlear pathology is eighth nerve tumor or else something wrong in the brain. Retrocochlear pathology refers to pathology behind the cochlea, which is not all that common. It's rather rare, to tell you the honest truth, but it's rather dangerous. Do you know what? A, do you know another? Um, uh, retrocochlear pathology that learning disabilities in children, children who are, who, 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 who have, what do you call, who can hear, they just can't listen. They can't focus and pay attention. In schools, little boys, more than little girls, have this. And that's nothing wrong with the ear. The ear is perfectly normal. It's just the way the brain is processing and handling sound. Their language acquisition is a bit delayed. And so that can really be a problem in young boys especially, and they can often get into trouble, end up as teenagers in juvenile detention centers, then they get labeled, and then they turn into criminals, and all kinds of bad things happen. So we school boards are well aware of it. Audiologists do tests for it. It's called Central Auditory Processing Disorders, C-A-P-D. But we're not there yet. We're just, I'm just talking. Okay, so I'll share a screen here, and we can almost go just go way over to the to the top here, and see where were we. What we were gonna what we're gonna pick up next week when we go into this topic: eighth nerve and C A N S, central auditory nervous system. Eighth nerve and C A N S. We're gonna be talking to you about a typical neuron, what they look like. Okay, here's a typical neuron. We're going to be talking about nerves versus tracts. 
versus ganglia versus nuclei. Here's another pair of nerves talking to each other. There's a synapse between the two nerves. This is a multipolar neuron. This is a bipolar neuron. And you think about bipolar as a mental disease. The ear, the eighth nerve, is a bipolar neuron. It gets really depressed and really happy. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, but the eighth nerve has a certain shape. It has one arm here and one arm here. It's not a multipolar neuron like these. Multipolar neurons are motor neurons. They go to your muscles. Sensory neurons that pick up info and send it to your brain, like vision, taste, hearing, are bipolar neurons. They have a cell body with two long arms. Here's a multipolar neuron. Here's a bipolar neuron. These are unipolar neurons, very rare in the human body, but nonetheless, we'll be talking about synapses and the way neurons talk to each other. Here's your cranial nerves. You have 12 pairs of these guys, 10 and 2. 12 pairs, usually indicated by Roman numerals. The eighth pair is ours, okay? And it meets right here. And we'll talk about the brain stem. Here's your brain stem. This is your cerebellum, this white area. And this is your cortex. Now you're looking at the person again from the bottom up, okay? So brain stem, that's the spinal cord inside your skull. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves coming off of it. These here are your uh, nerves of smell. We don't understand how smell works at all. Okay. Here's your spinal cord showing you of all the pairs of nerves coming off of it, 31 pairs. So you have 31 pairs of nerves coming off your spinal cord. But once you enter your head, you've got 12 pairs. And these 12 pairs are called your cranial nerves. And there's the eighth nerve that we talked about, and we'll carry on much more on this section, the eighth nerve specifically, next week. All right, I will stop here. As I said, the promise was to go over the physiology and tie that up in a bow, and then to open the door and peek inside our last unit. We'll take two weeks to cover the last unit, next week and the week afterwards. And then, shucks, it's getting close to Christmas. All right. Any questions so far? Not that I can think of. Good stuff. Anyway, study hard. I know you'll succeed. Stay in touch if you have any questions. It's been a slice. Live long and prosper. Adios. I'm going to stop recording right here and now. Bye. Cheers to you. <laughs>